is my fourth time at MicroConf, third time speaking, which is always um, exciting and cool. Um, way back when I did the first talk at MicroConf, it was my first talk ever. When Rob invited me, I was super scared. Obviously, I'm still scared every time, but more scared than usual. And I gave what I consider to be a very tactical sort of talk. Um, and I've sort of not given that many tactical talks, but we're going to get right back to kind of the original stuff that I love talking about, which is the actual words on the page. When you're writing copy for your uh, landing pages, website, onboarding emails, all your emails, everything, um, there's so much to know, but ultimately it comes down to the words you actually put on the page, the word choices that you make. So I'm talking to you today about money words. We have to call it I mean, money words sounds like kind of dumb, right? But um, these are words that perform really well again and again. So we produce a lot of, I think we're still good. Uh, we produce a lot of copy uh, over many, many years, lots and lots of it. And so we went back through and did a sort of audit of our highest performing copy. And we looked at our not as high performing copy too. And um, identified some of the words that recur again and again. So when you're thinking of writing copy for your business or when you're reviewing copy that someone else writes for your business, um, you're going to be looking obviously at the words. And I want to give you some ideas, some food for thought for when you're actually putting the words on the page and choosing what to eliminate versus what to keep. So these are like high ROI words and phrases that we use all the time. Um, so what kinds of ROI are we talking about? So um, just to give you some background, because normally when I talk, I walk you through like case studies, like here's what we did, here's what happened, here's what the results were when we tested it or whatever. So I'm not going to walk you through exact case studies like that, but I want to give you some background because microconf attendees are naturally skeptical, which I love. Um, and so I want to walk you through like, so you're like, okay, where is this coming from, Joanna? Like it's one thing that you're on stage, but what are you guys actually doing? So we work with a lot of tech companies in particular, but also some oddballs <laughs> like, um, uh, sports and entertainment, which is always shocking because I can't tell like a baseball from a football, but it's neat to be invited to help with that. Um, but we work with companies like Sprout Social, Prezi, Canva, Wistia. We've done something with a couple years back now, actually, and Shopify again more recently. Um, companies beyond that, too. Those are just some pretty cool ones to mention. Examples of ROI, I've talked about this a lot. I think I talked about this two years ago at MicroConf, 3.5 times the paid conversions with these eight emails that we rewrote for Wistia. So uh, nearly 20% drop in churn for emails that we rewrote or wrote for Canva, no, rewrote for Canva for work. And that might not sound like a lot, but that's a really big like scale. Like there's a lot of signups going on there and impacting churn like that was pretty powerful. Um, and then outside of the tech world, we also, I mean, Copy Hackers is an online training business, actually. So we work with a lot of people in online training. And there's this woman named Amy Porterfield who has a really badass training business. And uh, this, the techniques, some of the stuff we're going to talk about today, um, were part of this 3,000 students being enrolled in a $2,000 course. So you can do the math pretty easily on that one. And that happened in a very short window. So lots of stuff. I, again, this is more copy hacker stuff. So we did a half million dollar five day launch with these techniques. We're in the middle of another one that's doubling that right now. Um, a sales page course that we did, you know, 150 in about 60 hours with three emails and one sales page and nothing else around it. Um, and of course, you have to have like a platform and other things, things like that. But once you've already got people coming to you, how do you get them to actually convert? Um, and we, this is our 10x freelance copywriter where it's our monthly recurring revenue. So, um, so yeah, so we're doing what I'm going to show you as part of writing copy for these high converting campaigns, um, focusing on money words, focusing on word choice. Has anybody heard of a word that you um, believe is a high converting word. Do you have any examples? Like when I say, ooh, it's like a magic word. Free. Free. Closing soon. Free. Closing soon. Free. Right? Safe. Safe. Best. Has anybody heard of, what did you say? Buy it now. Buy it now. Okay. You heard this one? Because. So I'm not going to talk about because today because um, it's one of the possibly more common ones out there if you've read Cialdini's influence anyway for the marketers in the room. Um, it's not that it's a bad word. It's a good word, but we haven't 
tested anything with it. I, it doesn't come up often in the copy that we write, so I'm not going to stand up here and teach you anything that has anything to do with what I don't know. Only things that have been working for us and because is not one of them. So seven of them are quite different from that. Now, I know we just got back from lunch, and so people are like, ooh, speaking after lunch is the worst because you're in a food coma, but I always really like it because you're not thinking about food. You're done thinking about food, and my mind always thinks about food. So I want to quiz you because why not, right? You're a captive audience, and I'm on stage. I get to choose. Just kidding. Uh, pop quiz then for word choice, okay? Put yourself in. It's time for you to write copy or to review copy for your business. What do you do? If you have a big objection to overcome, so you know that your reader has an objection, you have to overcome it. Can you think of any copywriting technique you know, maybe one that I've mentioned or spoke about first in my very first microconf talk, anything that you should prioritize in your copy? You have a big objection to overcome. Acknowledging the objection with anything in particular? You don't have to have the answer. Okay, so there are some things floating around, but by and large, we're not that sure, right? And that could just be because you're like, Joe, I just sat down, <laughs> like calm down, like I know I might be sure later, give me a chance. So we're gonna walk through this stuff, but another question. If you had particularly jumpy customers, like people who are like, uh, um, anything that could make them feel they're deciding logically, not emotionally, what's a word you might use? What's a phrase you might use? Validated. Okay, a couple ideas. No one feels that confident. Okay, we're gonna get you there. If you're struggling to keep people reading down the page or down the email, we often all default to, oh, nobody reads, let's just make it short. That's the easiest way to avoid this problem that they're not reading. Just like pull the words off the page. Any way that you can use copy, use actual word choice to keep them moving down the page. Anything come to mind? Puberty? What did I hear? Like, maybe? We'll try that. We'll test that one next and see what happens. Okay, we're going we're gonna to get to all of that. Before the end of the session, you're going to have answers to that, and hopefully you will feel confident with those going forward. Let's get into the very first money word. Can anybody think of a word? Just a word that you use when you're writing or that you've heard us talk about before, or something like that, that works repeatedly. Money. We're hearing a lot of free and money. Where are you guys? Frank Kern teaching you guys how to write copy? Like, no offense, everybody's like, who's Frank Kern? Don't look him up. Um, okay, so we're going to get into the money word number one. But first, before we do, which of these, I'm going to give you a couple examples, which of these makes it feel like the outcome or benefit is more within reach for you? Okay, so our job is to make sure that people who are reading our copy actually believe it in some cases, just by them actually thinking like, oh yeah, that could happen, that, that's, that's for me. Okay, two options here. You can feel free to not shout out if you're like, I don't like your quizzes, or you can. You could win a million dollars, or you should win a million dollars. Which one feels more within reach? B, let's try again. A, okay. You could file your taxes without worrying, or you, should file your taxes without worrying. A's and B's. You could be as famous as Kim Kardashian, or you should be as famous as Kim Kardashian. Should is the winner. So why though? What are we talking about? What's really going on with the word should? So when we're talking about could, we're talking about aspiration. You could win a million dollars. You could win the lottery. And a lot of people buy into that, right? And, but most of us aren't selling lottery outcomes. We're not selling this big, huge goal, but we still try to make our copy really ambitious. We're trying to set goals that are huge for people. Like if Weight Watchers tried to sell you on going from 300 pounds to 120 pounds, that's really aspirational, but how within reach does that feel? You could lose 180 pounds versus you should lose 180 pounds. So when we're talking to people in ways that feel more one-on-one, -on -one, like on our websites, in our landing pages, in our emails, absolutely, we suspend this idea of aspiration, just throw it, don't worry about aspiration when you're writing copy, and unrealized destiny, regret, and the restoration of justice can feel far more human, which is what's really going on with the word should. Aspiration is could, right? You could get something amazing out of this. Now, 
I was telling Josh Kaufman <laughs> that I have all of these. Uh, now that I'm like 40, I can't see anything anymore, so that's fun. Look forward to that. Um, but I have a whole bunch of little examples here that I'm going to read out to you. I just have to get them up. Um, the first one here. Okay, example of should in practice. You can't, maybe you can read this, possibly not. Um, okay, this is an email that we sent, that monthly recurring revenue, the 30 MRR that we have for the 10X freelance copywriter membership site. Um, this was an email in that, so it goes. Um, gonna storm right out of the gates and say it. If you're a freelance copywriter who still hasn't hit the levels of revenue, respect, um, and real badassness the gig should entail, you need to hang with me on this webinar today. We're gonna skip all the career fair stuff and dive straight into the biggest mistakes that are straightjacketing your freelance biz, reducing what should be a lucrative and predictable six-figure affair into, and so on. So not what could be, but what should be. And what's really going on here? This is like, has anybody seen the movie, The Shawshank Redemption? Has anybody not seen the movie The Shawshank Redemption? Because you have to leave. Like, I don't know who you are, I can't talk to you anymore. Um, so what was going on in that movie? We watch it, so how's, who's seen it more than once? Yeah, so a lot of us have, some of us who haven't, it was too heart-wrenching to get through a second time. What was going on? So this guy, this seemingly perfectly normal human being, loses everything, goes through the most traumatizing, horrible experience for like 20 years of his life and ends up, spoiler alert, but you don't deserve to be here anyway if you haven't seen it. No, I'm just kidding. But spoiler alert, at the end, he has to climb through a two football fields length of raw sewage to get to his life on the other side of the walls. Like, that is not aspirational. It wasn't some guy who didn't deserve to get out, who could live on the other so side of the walls. It was someone who should be on the other side of those walls. So when you're going through, and this is just a quick check for you to do when you're writing copy, if you see can or could in your copy, try replacing it with should. See if you can tap into that and really connect with what people are actually feeling on like a personal level, level. not incredible amounts of aspiration, but like restoring an injustice in their lives. Like they're doing the work. They're doing X or Y or Z. They graduated from university. They should be X. There's so many things that we're already doing in life um, and you're just trying to correct that injustice. Should is money word number one. Money word number two. Okay, copyschool.co, we're, <laughs> we're at the very end of this launch right now. This one word and a variation of it makes up 5% of the copy on a page filled with 10,000 words. Any idea? You guys, well done. Hey, I'm gonna pretend I taught you that, but you just guessed because I didn't say anything. Yes, you or a variation of it, 517 out of nearly 10,000 words are you or your. Now, this is something I talk about quite a bit. A really good trick that I recommend that you follow um, is to rewrite every line of your um, copy with the word you at the start. So look on your website, look in your emails, and if you have a copywriter who's doing this for you or somebody on your team acting like a copywriter, Go through, and the exercise is rewrite every single sentence. Don't think about it, just do it. Rewrite every sentence with you as the subject. You or your, that's it. And I guarantee if you go to your site, you'll be like, whoa, none of these start with you. So it's gonna be like a really good exercise. So I randomly um, was like, okay, I have to find an example for this. So I went to Drift, because I was on their site anyway, because we use Drift, and I was there for another reason. So I went to their homepage, I think it was, and just grabbed, and this is like, because this is everywhere. You can see it everywhere, so it's a really easy one for most of us to fix. This is what they have. I'll read it for you. This is, conversations not forms, okay. With Drift on your website, any conversation can be a conversion. Instead of traditional marketing and sales platforms that rely on forms and follow-ups, Drift connects your business with the best leads in real time. Now, like, as like, readers of the site, we can look at them and go like, yeah, that's, that's perfectly fine copy. Like, that sounds good. I'd be happy if my site sounded like that. It's short, <laughs> so people are all like, happy with that. But if we rewrite it, can we make it sound, while keeping the message exactly the same, can we make it sound more like it's actually about your prospect so they can see themselves on the page in ways that maybe they kind of can't right now? So this is us just rewriting it, not testing it. This is how you would do it. 
So the headline and that crosshead and stuff stays the same. We're just working on the body copy. Your team can turn any conversation into a conversion with Drift on your website. You'll get the best leads in real time in ways you simply can't with traditional marketing and sales platforms. So now we're fully talking you. And now when a person comes to the page, what do people care about? Do they care about you? Maybe they care about themselves, possibly a little more, probably a lot more than they care about you, possibly entirely more than they care about you. They don't have any interest in you whatsoever. You're the worst. No, you're not the worst, but they don't care, right? So they care about themselves, and the rare exception is those who care about you more than themselves, or at least as much, and that's like Apple fanboys and stuff like that, where you don't even have to write copy to begin with, so don't even worry about like solving for those people. We want to begin with you and your things like that wherever possible making that the subject. So we did this in our copy school launch. I won't read it all out, but the sentence, a couple sentences here are, you don't have time to play a poor man's game of copywriting chicken with the blinking cursor. Your CMO, your client, your employees, they can't wait until you feel inspired enough to write the copy that keeps everyone, including the company's Bernie's, Burmese dog, uh, fed. So that's just beginning with you, right? And that's a really straightforward, easy thing for you to do right away. And then the more you do this, the more you will just start naturally being the focus of the copy that you write. So you won't always have to go through and manually insert you in order to actually express that this is for your reader and it's not about you, it's about them. Going forward, you'll get into more natural things where like this entire block, which you don't have to read, this whole block is all about you but at no point does it actually lead with the word you. It'll just start coming more naturally. But importantly, this needs to be like a filter for us when we're writing copy or reviewing copy other people write for you. Definitely doing that. Is you the subject? Is, the, is you the subject? Now, you can say I. And if you have at all, for some reason, um, read direct response copywriting type stuff, you'll probably know that a lot of old school copywriting always led with I, it was very story-based leading with I. I would argue that those days are kind of over. You can say I, you can talk about your product, but only after you've talked about them first, repeatedly. So for the copywriter mastermind, we lead with you in the copy, we're talking about you, 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 you. Then we do a quick transition and only then can we talk about ourselves. Only once you've earned the right and said like, yeah, I know this is about you, this matters more to you, everything here should be about you, only then are you okay to switch into talking about your product. And this is even true on your about page and your contact page, in case you're like, that's not true for those places. Nope, it's true everywhere, true everywhere. And this is just the you rule, really straightforward thing, easy for you to keep um, and start using in your own copywriting. Now that's where if you wanted to get this, you could, but don't worry about it. Money word number three, okay, so we've got should instead of could, we have you wherever possible. Money word number three is two that work together, actually. Still and already. Now, what's going on here is pretty similar to what was going on with the should word to begin with. It's this idea that you've put in all of this work, you've already done X, and still Y isn't happening. You've already gone through X, and still Y isn't happening. So we use this all over the place. Um, quick little examples here that I'll read off for you so you know about them in context. Um, so which means, this is an email that we did for um, copy school two years ago. Um, so the copy reads, which means you'll still struggle the next time you're supposed to produce a high converting email campaign. Um, You'll still think of copywriting as something you guess at, and as a consequence, you'll you still actually guess at it. You'll still live in a world where you never, ever get that feeling that comes with publishing new copy. So still, just getting into, right? Still, you're already, you're doing, you're still gonna get this effect even though you're doing some sorts of work. Um, and then over on the other side, you already know that a 10X freelance copywriter career won't happen. So what are the things that are already going on for your prospect that they already know that they're already doing and they're not getting the results that they expected. If you can join them in that moment and talk through that with them, that's gonna be really powerful for them because it's true to them. It's not just putting the word you on the page like we just did in the last one. It's actually going back to like what you're going through. So the more you know about your prospect, and I know that some of the speaker, uh, the attendee talks today um, are covering stuff here, so there's more to come on that. But the more you know about that person who's reading your copy, the more you can actually tap into things like you're already doing this and still you're not getting that. So we use it all over the place. Already, what's going on here? 
is already is a word that signals, like these are signals, this is word choice, it's intentional word choice. It signals a step taken, which ought to put the reader ahead. So what's a thing that your prospect has done where they should have gotten ahead because of it? If you're talking to like new grads, they graduated, they put in the work, there should be something good on the other side of that. Um, and then still signals a lack of progression um, in spite of the step taken. So this is all part of something called exclusive empowerment, which you can use if you want to nerd out on it. Um, and that's just like what, what, what empowers your prospect in ways that other people are not empowered. So what's actually going on for those people who turn into paying customers for you? What was happening for them immediately before they signed up to learn from you or to choose your product or whatever that might be? Now these appear all over our long form sales pages and they always, generally always appear together or in close proximity. Um, so here is another one. This is from the digital course, no, this is from a different one for Amy Porterfield. The sign up at the top here. This is the beginning of a long form sales page. So the goal is definitely to like pull people in. Important question for coaches, experts, course creators, and online business owners who still don't have a profitable email list of 2,500 engaged, ready to buy subscribers. So can you see a little bit how that word still is starting to bring people in and match this, this idea that they have, like this goal that they had, um, but they're still not getting the results. And it puts them in a place of like feeling their pain without having to po poke too hard at their pain. They're put back in that moment. Your job is to get them there. This is also all over all sorts of sales emails that we write. I just gave this as an example, and these all do work together. Um, still already and should work really well together. And then we have these here as well for Amy Porterfield, the emails that brought in that essentially is $6 million in a week. Um, you're already sold on creating digital courses. You just haven't found the right guidance, implementation plans, or accountability to confidently green light the project. You've already been investing time, energy, and money in building your digital courses, course, but have suffered from momentum crushing missteps and misfires more than any entrepreneur can reasonably, reasonably endure. So again, this is like this is the kind of stuff that might feel like, why would we do this? When you invest in doing this, when you try to do this stuff, when you like, look at copy as so much more about a conversation, what's really going on with people, than just you know, random words, keep it short, bold stuff, et cetera, et cetera, you can get more inside their heads. And so again, this is all over the place, everywhere. Now, what's going on here, what copywriters know, um, is that even nuanced moments of VIPness are really important for getting people to say yes to you. So again, that's tapping into what your prospect has already gone through, poking at it, saying like, look, you already did this. You should be getting this result, but you're not. Getting into that can help bring them into the conversation. Okay, now this is a really tactical one because that was kind of like up in the air sort of thing. The next one is here's the thing. Does anybody use this or a variation of it in your copy? Some of us do, right? Yeah, so I use it I use it all the time. Any paragraph that I have that starts to feel a bit long, I just throw in, here's the thing, or the tricky thing is, or things like that, make it its own line, and people pay more attention to it, and I'm gonna talk through um, why that is. Here's an example. Um, ba -bum -bum. Hold on, because I went through those. Okay, so this is um, just a newsletter. This is just an invitation to come to one of our live events. Um, oh, sorry, live online events. So sideways sales pages are the pages that are responsible for some of the biggest launches in the last 10 years. We hit our first half million dollar launch when we added an SSP to our launch process and marketers like Jeff Walker completely swear by them. But the tricky thing is this, how do you actually script the videos that go on those pages? Now what's going on in that moment? That, but, the, but the tricky thing is this, or the here's the thing moment. You're breaking up, oh, was someone actually answering that? Oh, I saw a hand go up and I was like, okay, cool, take over. Um, but you're breaking up this flow, this like people are just stuck in it and reading and like, okay, paying attention. But now you're drawing attention to something. And the thing that you're actually drawing attention to, the but here's the thing, is a really kind of an empty statement, right? It's not saying anything, but it's setting up what comes next. And that's where you want the part that's most important to follow what comes right after that. And that's something called the Bucket Brigade. Has anybody heard of this? No? Okay, well this is good. You guys are gonna have so much to walk away with. Okay, so the Bucket Brigade idea goes way back to like firemen putting out 
fires as groups way back in, let's say, the 1800s. I don't know when, back before there were fire hydrants and hoses, I guess. So they would stand in a lineup with all the water over here, fire over there. And men would stand here in these lineups. And they'd have buckets, right? I think we've seen this on like Bugs Bunny or the Flintstones or something, like this, this idea. And they'd move the water through, and now it's called the Bucket Brigade to put out the fire and just keep putting it through. But it's that, this idea of moving something, moving a piece of information further down the line, so you have to kind of keep following it. So, but here's the thing gets you in there. Other things are things as simple as first things first with a colon after it, then a line break. Second thing second, colon after it, line break. Especially when you're writing emails. I know, I know because I've heard it for 15 years that you want to keep your emails short, you want to keep your landing pages short. Try not <laughs> keeping them short and try actually using some of these techniques to pull the reader along so they keep paying attention even when you're like, no, people don't read. This is how they keep reading. You add in things like that. This is not it. You do not just want to say, here's a whole bunch of shit, here are some bullets, click on one of them. That's not what we're talking about. So what's happening here is this idea of getting people to stick with you, no matter how much you're telling them. So obviously we want to be interesting at all times, but sometimes we need to use more words than we feel comfortable with, especially when you're reviewing copy as a team and everyone's like, oh, no one reads online. And you're like, oh, I want to die. Um, people do read online, they don't read boring things. And they can read more if you help them along. So we talk about like scannable copy a lot, Scannable copy isn't about you know, bolding the most important thing on the page or using bullets. That's not. That's, you're not trying to write copy for people who don't have time for you. That's not going to work out. You have such better opportunities for people who do have time for you to actually speak with them and connect with them. So instead of bolding the thing in the middle of the page that you think is an important thing you don't want someone to miss, if you bold the things that come directly before the thing you want people to pay attention to, then they're more likely, as I'm scanning down the page and I see, but here's the thing bolded there, now I'm like, oh, what's the thing? And I'm reading it. And that's what we need to do with our emails. Not just let people walk away without reading anything, but give them a reason to keep reading it. And we do that all over the place. Here, again, is another example. Okay, we're getting down to the final ones in our money words. So far we have should, you, what else? Already and still, and we just did. Here's the thing. I like, okay, I think I would have done well in like teaching grade three, except for the kids. Okay, <laughs> uh, money word number five. The truth is, the fact is. Okay, this is a good one. It's like Bucket Brigade, just like that, um, but it's signaling something way cooler. It's not as empty as the here's the thing. So on the Digital Course Academy page, again, that I, I mentioned already with Amy Porterfield, uh, this truth or fact was used six times on that page alone. And we used it all over our copy school. We use it all the time. Um, here is an example. I'll just point these out for you so you can have a look at them. Um, the, here's the, let me just go up close. Um, right, I can't see it because I'm old. Uh, here's the thing, here's the thing. The truth is, the fact is, all of these, again, and again, right? We're saying it all over the place. The truth is colon, the fact is colon, those sorts of things. Again, you're tapping into something like logic. So people want to believe that they're making logical decisions. We all know this. We know that they're making it emotionally and we know that we have to make them feel like this is a logical thing. Word choice can do that. Simply saying the fact is, or the truth is, seeing that word is a lot like that magic word because. Because is also a signal of logic. Like, I want to do this because we believe that everything that follows the word because is going to be like, oh, there's a logical reason for this. Same with the truth is and the fact is. Now, obviously it's about tone too. So if you're like, the truth is all the time and you sound like a little know-it-all, then that's probably not gonna go that well. But if you use it sometimes when you know that people are like, mm, and they're feeling something and they want to be pulled out of that feeling for a moment so that they actually tell themselves, this is a logical decision I'm making, this is what we want to do. Obviously, we need to tell ourselves that we are ba basing our decisions on logic. Cool. That brings us to, this is one that I spoke about at MicroConf in the very first talk, 
Um, afterward, Heaton Shaw wanted to work with me after that, so I feel like this is a money word just because Heaton was like, hey, let's work together. So I'm like, yeah, I'll always talk about even if. But even if. So has anybody used even if in their copy? Okay, this is one of those, back, <laughs> back of the room, of course. Um, this is one of those um, classic go-tos that's going to like really immediately impact your copy, just like the you rule will. If you got our book that we put out years ago that Rob mentioned, um, uh, where stellar messages come from, just in writing the book alone and knowing that people reading it, we had to overcome their objections too. Uh, we have even if throughout that. And it was on 10x emails on our uh, sales page where it reads, even if you've um, never sent an email before, you're terrified of unsubscribes, uh, your list is microscopic, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so even if, is the beginning of this whole objection handling experience, right? So the persuasion technique here is simply objection handling. Here is how you make it work in your copy. You take the benefit or the outcome that you want people to believe, the benefit that you're selling them on, the advantage, depends how you look at it, but the, the benefit or the outcome. Then you add the word even if, and then you put the objection. That's, that's it. So you take the benefit, even if, objection, it's so brutally simple. If you apply it to your crossheads on almost any page and you'll think, oh, people will notice I'm reusing this, don't worry about it. Um, just start by doing that. So an example is, immediately boost your copy's persuasive power. Let's say if that was my benefit for you, you're going to immediately boost your copy's persuasive power, even if you've never written a line of copy. And we could keep subbing in different objections and subbing in different benefits too. And you can do that all over your page and it very quickly becomes this, this absolute signal um, that you know, leads to objections being far better handled than if you just kind of avoid them. Obviously, importantly here is you wanna make sure you're doing this without like introducing the objection. So the more you know about where your customer is in their customer journey, the better that will work. But again, don't overthink it, just start using it. Money word number seven, we're already there. You're like, Joanna, it's copywriting. It's good for you. It's not an already thing for me. Okay, money word number seven is what? Any idea what fills this in? Whatever word your prospect keeps using. That's what we want to sub in there. And we need to learn what that is, of course. This is just word mirrors. So originally, I wanted to give the whole talk on word mirrors alone. And this idea that, um, this bigger kind of idea that you need to reflect your prospect on your page so well that they can actually see themselves where they are and where they're going to be next. Not their huge aspirational self, but where they're gonna be next. So that's our job as copywriters and growth marketers. That's what we're trying to do. Create these word mirrors. Okay, here's how we did it. So this is something that you can apply really quickly. Does anybody use thank you pages for like signups, couple? Does anybody not use a thank you page somewhere? Most of us have thank you pages. What are you doing with your thank you pages? What goes on them? This is a real question. <laughs> so I can have water. What goes on them? The next call to action, awesome, good. That's rare, but yes, good. Anything else? Do you know what's on your thank you page? Thank you, bye. <laughs> like what now? A gift, the rabbit with the pancake on his head? I think we once had one like that because we thought it was funny and then we realized it was a tragic waste of space. Anybody else? Yeah? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> thank you, Paige, yeah. We'll talk. Okay, so thank you, Paige, after a person does something and you thank them, what more can you do on that page? So for Copy School, immediately after a customer purchased Copy School 2018, this was last year, we had a thank you page. On that page, we actually decided to use it. And we asked them this question. Type form embedded easily on, uh, this was a lead pages, landing page as well. What was going on in your life that brought you to join Copy School today? This is the question. When I was back at Conversion Rate Experts, this one was one that 
we rolled out to everybody, and I was part of making that survey. I was like the lead on making that survey. We rolled it out, used it across client after client, gigantic clients. It opens your eyes because it's, it's going to be open-ended as well. People have to answer that question. So the question is, what was going on in your life that brought you to blank today? brought you to sign up for our webinar today, brought you to want to change your project management software today, that brought you to X today. What's the thing that you want to ask them about? What did they just do? Now you want to find out why, because then you can join the conversation happening in the heads of people who are also like they are, of course, right? That's what we do. So we asked that question and we got, I mean, we talked to copywriters. So we got some like obnoxious things like the answer, one of them was, Groping in the dark of uneducated purgatory, destined to be chained to low wages and toxic work environments, yet unwilling to surrender to the perils of loserdom. <laughs> Which like made my day kind of in reading it, and like thank you for that break. Um, some of them are gonna be far more useful than that and you'll see actual like words and synonyms for them repeating throughout. So we saw the same kind of word repeating again and again. It was confidence or a version of confidence, a word like confidence. We saw it so much in these responses, and there were hundreds and hundreds of responses here. We saw it so much that we were like, okay, that's, that's gotta be a money word. So we added it in to the remaining emails for our um, launch for Copy School, and that was, of course, we've got confidence as our money word. Now let me use my iPhone if I can. Um, so that led to, of course, us writing this email and we add this whole section in here and this entire section, I'm just gonna zoom in and show you up close. The entire section is just selling confidence. That's it. We use the word confidence, we use variations of the word confidence again and again in this. And of course we would because that's what people were saying they were signing up to get. They wanted confidence. We'll give you confidence. So we used it all over the place here, knowing that that's actually what they are getting out of it too. They weren't saying they wanted one thing. We were like, oh damn, I wish we had that. Like they actually, they could get that out of it in the end. So the most convincing copy, as we all know, it's not waiting in a list of money words. Those are all gonna be good. You is gonna be good again and again, still and already and should, those are gonna be good. But the real words, of course, that are actually going to move the needle are the ones that are actually waiting in your customers' heads, your current, your ex, all of that stuff. And we know that, but are you doing it? Are you going in and looking for the words and then taking exactly what they say and putting it on the page? That's our objective. So now that you know, I'm gonna quiz you again. If you have a big objection to overcome, any idea what technique you should try in your copy? Even if, oh, does my heart look good? Okay, even if. Precisely. Okay, if you have particularly jumpy customers, any idea what phrase you should use to make them feel they're deciding logically, not emotionally? Truth is, fact is. And if you're struggling to keep people reading down the page, any idea what you should do in your copy? Here's the thing. Use them all together for maximum ROI, and then tell me how it goes. Thanks, guys. That's all. Uh, Joanna, thank you for a great talk. Mm. I heard you speak about 18 months ago, oh. and where the, the premise of your talk was to talk in the customer's voice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but almost everything you've been talking about today has been talking in our own voice, right? We're saying okay. you as opposed to talking from the perspective of the customer. Okay. I was wondering whether you had thoughts on how to maybe meld these two ideas, um, and if you could just expand on that just for a minute. Yeah. Totally. So I think that's great. And this is part of, this is exactly part of that. So um, between all the voice of customer data, like what you're selecting from what customers tell you, then you have to figure out how to string that together, right? So words like should, like when, you, when it comes down to it, you have to make some word choices. Sometimes you'll put could in, and now I'm just saying you should put should in. When it comes to you, you're still going to use voice of customer. Um, that's completely it. So I think about, and this isn't an example that I put in here because I talk about it a lot, um, but we rewrote the homepage for uh, Sweatblock, which is this, um, anybody know what Sweatblock is? It's like if you, yeah, have hyperhidrosis. Um, and it just helps you like if you sweat a lot. But we opened the page up and this was fully based, it had I think 5,000 Amazon reviews and our whole exercise was can we just take like language from Amazon reviews for this product and use what reviewers say about it to write the copy. So we did. 
and it beat the control by more than 50% in paid conversions. But uh, the headline became, and it was in quotation marks, and that's one of a bonus money word thing that I didn't get to. Um, but it was in quotations, and it was like, um, the headline read, it doesn't even have to be hot out, my armpits are always wet. That was in the first person that was taken from voice of customer data. So yeah, like helping the people see themselves on the page. But when I see it in the first person in quotation marks, I look at it, and if I feel that way, now I'm reading along, right? And as, I, as you keep reading down the page, then we transitioned into you. So we took things out of the first person with the quotation marks, and we had a whole section that was just listing out exact examples of what people with hyperhidrosis have to deal with, pulled in that voice of customer data. Like um, people would say, I have to tuck tissues inside my shirt. I, um, I can't give high fives. I always wear black. And so we put that in, in the, in the second person, where it's like, you're always, you always wear black. You can never wear light gray, that sort of thing. And so you're doing the same thing. And those are all like a thousand money words, right? Those are all just a variety of words that come from what the customer is actually saying. So the two work together. Yeah, but it's a great question. Thanks. We have time for one or two over here. Hi, Joanna. Hi. Great talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, at the beginning, you said that you studied copy that had worked and copy that hadn't worked. And I wondered if you had a corresponding list of words that you avoid because All of the that. other ones? No, I'm just kidding. Um, I don't have a list of words not to use again. I did, however, <laughs> recently accidentally send a subject line, an email with the subject line that was my placeholder when I don't know what my subject line will be. Um, and it was FSDF, SFDF, or whatever, like you type it quickly over on the side of the keyboard just to like fill in the field and move on with your life. It went out uh, with that in it, so I would recommend just double checking everything you write to like pull out the FSDFs out there. But no, there is no, there was no like, oh wow, that stands out as like that's the worst thing. It was mostly like, oh, we just attacked the whole problem wrong. <laughs> yeah, for things that don't work. Yes. Thanks. This is a specialization of the previous question. On the actual CTA button, I yeah. seem to see a lot of I want to get started kind of yeah. stuff. Is that do you? We teach that. Okay. So that's, <laughs> yes. still, that's still the thing. Except that we recommend that you don't put I want to in it, right? So if you're writing a CTA, the formula, the formula to follow, generally at least, is I want to and then blank. Whatever follows, like I want to increase my conversion rate, then increase my conversion rate becomes the button. Except when you're at the place where they're actually like in cart or ready, like they're about to have cash change hands and then you don't want a call to value, then you want like a call to action. Thank you so much, Jordan. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.